Hello and welcome to week 14. This week we are looking at linked data and the semantic web. This is the outline of what we will cover. So first we'll define what the semantic web is. Then we'll look at linked data and the semantic web, what that is and what it means. Then we'll move on to a description of triples, otherwise known as RDF statements. Then we'll move on to records and how they uh, compare to statements. Then we'll look at strings versus things. And then finally, we'll round up with a brief discussion on are we actually there yet? So what exactly is the semantic web? So here I'm providing you several images that are surrogates for different kinds of information. And they're all separate. But with the web, we can connect things through a series of links. That is the premise behind the web. In terms of the semantic web, the semantic web uses linked data, and we're not talking about resources, we're talking about data. So instead of linking to the resources, we're actually linking the data that describes the resource in some way together. So various materials that share the same data points are linked together. And what that does is it creates some, the semantic web, otherwise meaning behind those data points. Machines don't really understand um, the things that human minds understand. They don't understand the meaning behind a word, but they do understand in a roundabout way what the meaning behind data is if it has been provided in a particular way. And we'll look at just how that data needs to be provided to be meaningful. So in the typical web situation, links connect one page to another page. That's, that's what the web is all about in terms of uh, browsing the web. It's hyperlinks between resources or pages, and they link to one another. They can connect to entire pages. They connect, can connect from one section of one page to another section of the same page. Uh, there are all sorts of different ways that you can link resources together. No, none of those relationships are actually described between those resources or pages or sections of pages. There's no description behind what that link actually means, except for when you click it, click it, and then a human mind processes, oh, I see what's happening here. I understand what the relationship between these two documents or two pages are. In most cases, sometimes it takes you, a link may take you to a place that you don't understand. That's pretty unusual though. Usually our brains are really good at understanding the relationship between one. So link data on the semantic web is richer than that one-to-one -one link between resources or web pages or sections of web pages. The links between the connected pieces of data are described, as I pointed out a few minutes ago. That description that describes those links provides meaning, otherwise known as semantics, to that data. So if you think about querying a database, you are actually when you're retrieving things, or you may actually search this way based on the way that the database allows you to search it, you may perform fielded searches. So the meaning behind that data that you are querying has a richer uh, semantic. So you have a query of a title field, 
you're searching for a particular term, well, it means something different in a title field than it may mean in a materials field, than it may mean in a creator or author field. So there are semantics behind what you are querying in a database. That does not apply on the web by and large, although there are efforts underway by Google and other search engines to create this kind of automatic uh, knowledge map behind all the content on the web through things like natural language processing um, and using parts of speech um, systems that can then expand out or narrow down what the meaning is behind particular terms that are found on the web. So that's the difference between what happens on the web, where there's basically no meaning except for perhaps through what the search engines are doing, trying to create knowledge maps or underlying uh, webs of connected information uh, between what you do in, a, say, a library database uh, or another in information system, perhaps in a business setting, than what happens on the web. So the linked data and the semantic web tries to bring the kind of chaos and meaninglessness and disconnected knowledge on the web it, together in a way that actually is more meaningful and has semantics that is more reflective of what happens when you're querying a, a single system with fields that you can actually uh, provide more contextual information. The relationships between data points are also data too. So here I'm providing you a little graph um, that shows the way that links can be connected. So X may be based on something with the title down there, and down there has the genre that it's a work of fiction, and down there has the author, that's David Goodis. So all of those relationships is based on, has genre, has author. Those are data points too. Those are a specific kind of meaningful information, okay? So what, I'm, what you're seeing here is a 500 mark field that's then been presented as a graph and that's what you're looking at here, is a small little snippet of data about resources and the relationship between those resources. And that's basically the underlying principle behind this semantic web, that the data points and the relationships between those data points are all uh, information that is meaningful. So the basic principle behind linked data and the semantic web is what's known as a triple. A triple is also known as an RDF statement. Uh, RDF stands for Resource Description Framework, okay? And it's RDF's model of meaningful data. It's how you make data uh, more meaningful. It consists of nodes, which are the ovals, and an arc, which is the arrow. Sometimes the arc will be uh, straight, sometimes it'll be curved, sometimes it'll be like S shape. It really doesn't matter. Nodes are the, the circles and the arcs are the lines between the circuit, circles. So the triple part of the RDF statement comes from the fact that there are three parts. There's the subject, that's data about the resource. There's the predicate, which contains the property of the data about the resource as it relates to the object, which is the value of the data about the resource. And this sounds more, much more complicated than it actually is. And you'll... So when we have data and when we compare it to text, we need to think about what the differences are between those two things for creating linked data. We need to work with data instead of text in the, on the web for that to be meaningful because machines don't understand the text. 
we need to put it in a form that a machine can understand. So we need to point to data points as opposed to the text. Those data points mean what that text means to a machine where we need the text, the machine needs the data, okay? The data themselves have no embedded meaning. It's discrete and separate data, but that data has meaning for a machine in a roundabout sort of way. And this will become very clear in a moment. So here I'm just giving you an example of some text. It's this text says it's hardcover alkaline paper and the ISBN number for this particular text is this IS, uh, the data point for this particular text, which is a hardcover alkaline paper copy of a particular title. So those data points that we need to create the underlying semantics um, are represented through URIs, Uniform Resource Identifiers. So each thing that we're trying to represent, whether it's a title, a subject, an object, a person, any type of data point that we're trying to represent is identified through using a URI. They're discrete and it specifies a, a particular thing. And um, there can be multiples for each particular thing, and they can all be linked together. Those data points are meaningful, and that's the important takeaway here. So each of those URIs provide a link to the exact item and the meaning behind that particular thing that's being uh, represented. The, uh, there's a real nice addition that comes with those URIs, and that is that since language is largely removed from those bits of data that are meaningful, it's international in scope since the language is removed. So here I'm showing you three URIs for this same title or text. So one from Amazon, one from the Library of Congress, and another one from the Open Library, all pointing to the same title of this resource. So URIs, that's the underlying principle behind everything that happens with linked data. So identifiers are people that are obviously things to be described, so they also need to be identified. So this one is uh, these three URIs that I'm presenting here are for Jim Hightower, the author of the text that I just showed the URIs for. There are a number of different ways that you can identify authors. The most common one that's used for the semantic web is the Virtual International Authority File, or the VIAF.org. Uh, it's actually hosted at OCLC. And so here I'm providing you three URIs, all representing identifiers for this single author, Jim Hightower. Places are also things to be described, so they also need identifiers. And so the, identif uh, the identification of place for the title, there's nothing in the middle of the road but yellow stripes and dead armadillos, is Texas. So here I'm providing you three URIs to uh, data points that represent Texas. So now we need to have a brief discussion about what the difference is between a record versus statements. So in our typical library record or in a business setting, you'll have a record. It's a typical model for describing items. It consists of a series of statements that describe the item, a single item usually. Each statement has a property, what we've called an element or field, and a value that's representative of that item in that element. 
So on the table on the right, you see the property, there's that element or field name, and then you have the value for that particular item. So we have creator is Jim Hightower, the property of date has the value of 1997, the property for publisher has the value HarperCollins, the subject is American Wit and Humor, and so on and so forth. So that is a record. It has a property, and those properties have associated values that describe an item. And this should look very, very familiar. Now, when we have statements, we, we're going to go through several screens, and you'll see each time that each one of these columns has been transformed to a URI. So in this first case, we're looking at, okay, so we have this resource, which is the particular item that we're describing, has such and such a property, and that's the predicate. So this title, or this item, I should say, this item that's contained within the Library of Congress's uh, library system, has this particular title, and then there's nothing in the middle of the road but yellow stripes and dead armadillos. This particular item held in the Library of Congress has creator Jim Hightower, that's the author. This particular item has the date, 1997, and so on and so forth. So the, we're starting to create our statement uh, as opposed to looking at things uh, in the typical record format, now we're creating those RDF statements. So the first step was to create um, or provide a URI for the particular item that's being described. And here we're using the Library of Congress's um, unique identifier for this particular item in their library. So next, we're providing URIs that are representative of the properties and the values. So we have on the very left, again, the item as it's represented in the Library of Congress's catalog. It has a unique identifier, so it's one particular item. Then we have the property, and here we're using a list of these relationships that have been identified through at this uh, particular um, location, the pearl.org location, and it's saying, you know, for this Dublin Core element, it has this type of property, which is has creator, and then the value, which is the object of this RDF statement we're having a, a URI that points to this author, Jim Hightower. So all statements in their machine form, all those RDF statements or triples, as they're known in their machine form, consists solely of URIs. The identifiers, those URIs, make explicit to a machine the subject, the predicate, and the object in each RDF statement. So here I'm just providing you a, a, another graph that shows, you know, this particular item has author William Shakespeare, this particular title has title As You Like It, this particular item has the publisher, Cambridge University Press, so on and so forth. So again, you can grasp in your mind what this graph looks like when you have all of these linked data points presented as URIs, all these nodes and arcs interlock amongst one another and also interlock to other items that share the same kind of data points. Because as you know, there are multiple items that have the author William Shakespeare, just as there are multiple items that have the title As You Like It and multiple things that have the publisher, Cambridge University Press, have that same subject, have that same date. So now you can begin to see 
how the semantic web provides this much richer underlying uh, means by which to connect different kinds of things via the web. So here's just another triple presented in this graph form. So you have a node that shows a particular item in the Library of Congress and that it has a particular author and this link is uh, this one in the center. This node in the center is showing you the URI that another um, site is defining, has author. The last one I showed you was the pearl.org. This one is rdvocab.info site. It also identifies that kind of relationship in the predicate, has author. And then the final one is pointing to the Library of Congress's authority file, the name authority file that you should all be familiar with um, at this point in your coursework. So that's pointing directly to the Library of Congress's uh, URI that they have provided in an effort to support linked open data. And there are many, many, many resources that do exactly this within the library archi and archive um, communities. And so here you're seeing that statement, that triple in its kind of machine form at the bottom. And you can see how they link together and how um, the text is actually removed from that. And as a human, we really wouldn't be able to understand what that statement means, but in, in for a machine, in machine language, it has meaning. So uh, since you'll hear this sometimes if you're uh, reading anything on linked data, the semantic web, you'll hear strings or literals versus things or non-literals. So strings are strings of character that generally point to nothing else beyond itself. And strings are human readable. And those are the text points that we've come to know and love. Those are the things that you see in the table that are in black. And then you have things. And those things are strings of characters that can can link to other resources. Those are the URIs, and those are listed in green in the table. So strings are what we've been dealing with generally in the library world when we describe things in our records. Now we need to think, shift our thinking and instead provide uh, things, which are the URIs, that provide that uh, semantic meaning behind what traditionally had been provided as a string. So what can using triples create? Well, they can create really wonderful graphs of an entire um, knowledge universe. So here, it, this is a rather old image of um, a bunch of data sets that have been provided with this rich, meaningful way of describing the data sets. And so you're seeing each one of these nodes represents data sets in a different domain. So you have the ones in that light blue color are uh, data sets that pertain to different kinds of media. And the ones in the pinkish in the lower right all pertain to life sciences. And the ones in the yellow kind of to the left of the pink ones, those are geographic data sets. So you can see that the data can all be linked together. They can reference one another. They can talk about the same kinds of things. And they can be linked together in a way um, that actually describes what the information universe the shape of it, what it looks like, how many uh, items actually discuss that particular uh, or reference that particular topical area. So those are the, the nodes here that are really large. The smaller nodes are ones that have less links going in and out of them. 
So that is the general principle behind linked open data. And if you'd like more information about linked open data, you can go to the linkdata.org site and take a look. So is this a reality? Is the semantic web a reality? It isn't currently. We are definitely working in that direction and we are very close, but we currently lack a few things. We lack a, a really useful data creation system. There are some softwares that are available for specific, for specific domains and types of data that are um, being created, you know, linked open data that's being created, not data in the scientific sense. Um, we don't really have software that can handle the linked data and act upon it in a meaningful way. And we don't have a place where all this linked data can actually live and meet and mingle. Um, so that is definitely a drawback. However, we, as in the library and information science domain, do currently have a number of things in place that make this a very close reality. Many of the needed components are there. We have been using these components for a number of years. And here you should be thinking about all the standards that we have in place, because we know that we need a single way to represent particular kinds of information so that they are searchable and retrievable in a way that individuals don't have to search on like a thousand different variations. They can search one particular term or individual and return all items with that particular concept or that particular individual assigned to that particular item. And as I pointed out, the Library of Congress and other institutions like the Getty have provided URIs that are representative for that particular item, and they are exposing their data. That is linked open data that is available. And there are many institutions and a number of domains that are actually on board and providing access to their data in a linked and open way. And so this is really the foundation of the semantic web. Those technologies that underline the semantic web or what will become the semantic web will rely on URIs. And we are providing a lot of that basic content that needs to be there for the semantic web to become a reality. And in addition to that, we have lots of very interested and knowledgeable people about what it takes to create the semantic web. So we are really close and it will happen. Um, it's really just a matter of time. Uh, so I invite all of you to find out more about the semantic web and linked open data. Some things, uh, I'm just in no particular order, if you're interested in this area, things that you should look at are SCOS, which is Simplified Knowledge Organization System, which you can find information about at uh, W. 3C. So if you go there and type in SKOS, you will get a bunch of resources, very readable, lots of links between them, um, and you can take a look at what that means. And SCOS is actually the data model for structuring concepts in controlled vocabularies. Sounding familiar? Sounds a lot like linked up what you need is the foundation of linked open data. <clears throat> and other things that you, uh, or individuals that you should be aware of, um, Karen Coyle is one person who has written extensively in this area. And in fact, this lecture uh, pays homage in, a, in uh, uh, many ways to the work that she has done. So I suggest that you look up what she's written on the topic and presented on the topic. And other things, <clears throat> uh, 
look at for information about OWL, O-W-L, which is the Web Ontology Language, again, at W3C. And that's the semantic uh, web language that represents knowledge about things and the relation between things. So that's OWL, Web Ontology Language. Another thing that I would point you to is schema.org, a website that you'll want to take a look at that's critical for linked data and the semantic web. Um, so that is it for this week's lecture. I am going to end on um, with an image because it's, it's beautiful and because it really represents what the semantic web can hope. So this is an image of linked information represented um, through nodes and arcs. It's a large network of information that's all linked together. And this is really what the vision of the semantic web should look like, where items and data points are connected together to provide us with a much richer way to think about our information universe and interact with that inter information universe rather than siloed bits of information um, that are contained within systems that we have no access to uh, via the web, which is by and large many of our library um, systems, the databases, the OPACs, anything that has been used traditionally to describe our library content, content is by and large not accessible via the web. And so the semantic web provides us a means by which to actually provide access to library information in a much richer and more meaningful way. So I invite all of you to spend some time and effort exploring this topic because it is likely to be the wave of the very near future. So that's it. I've had a really wonderful time this semester with you all and I look forward to seeing what you all produce. Bye.